Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for joining us today um, uh, at the second of the DPONS webinars. This one is called DPONS version 2.0 model update and use. Um, today, we're going to be talking a little bit more in detail um, following on from our first webinar about, about four weeks ago, um, building on what was what was presented in that webinar, um, which covered a little bit more about the context of the DPONS model update um, and a little bit more about its context within the offshore wind industry. Today, we just have the two speakers. Um, uh, we have Jasper Kai Larsen from Vassenfall and Jacob Nild Nielsen from Aarhus University, who will be covering a little bit about the background of the, the program itself and then going into more detail about the program, um, the, the model update and its use. Hopefully you're familiar with the format of the webinar, but um, just to let you know that the, um, there is the opportunity at the end to do quite a, um, a long um, question and answer session. So make sure you, you are dropping in your questions into the format on the right hand side of your screen. Um, and we will go through those and I'll be um, running through those questions with the, with the panelists at the end. We are recording the session and so both the recording from the session um, and the slides will be available after the after the webinar on the Aarhus website. It will take us a few days to post process the, the, the recording but um, in, it will um, all be up, they uploaded and I will make sure that I will get, get you the recording at the end so you can re reference to this um, going forward in the future. Um, so Without further ado, I will um, introduce our first speaker, Jesper Kaid Larsen, who's the team lead of bioscience at Vattenfall, and he's going to do a short introduction to the DPANS program. Thank you, Jesper. I will just um, hand over to, to you. Thanks, Eloise. Well, welcome also from me on behalf of the DPONS team and the sponsors, on which behalf I've had the pleasure of managing the project. For the benefit of those of you not having attended the first webinar on the 21st January, I'm going to briefly introduce you to some basic facts about the DPONS project and outline what we hope to get out of it. If you didn't attend the first webinar and are interested to understand more about the background and, and how the project came about, you might want to check out the recording of that webinar, which is available at the Aarhus University DPONS website, or you can of course come back to me subsequently. As mentioned by Louise, having outlined the big picture in the first webinar, the aim of this second webinar is to go more in depth about the workings of the DPONS model, the changes with version 2.0, how to operate it, the outcomes and next steps and further opportunities for development. Hence, I will quickly get out of the way to leave Jakob Nelson from Aarhus University to talk you through that. I hope this will be useful and please don't hold back with any questions during the webinar or afterwards. There will be contact details at the end. As probably well known to most of you at this point, the aim of the DPONS project was to develop an evidence-based model for predicting the consequences of disturbance caused by wind farm piling noise relevant for the North Sea population of Harbour Porpoise. This was delivered on by our university a couple of weeks ago now with the release of version 2 of the DPONS model, meaning that the DPONS project has now come to its end. A huge amount of work has gone into this with our university delivering a fantastic research effort and overcoming all sorts of challenges, field work and software development wise. The project has had the privilege of having an advisory panel with leading scientists within the field and experts from regulators and agencies around the North Sea following the project, serving as an invaluable sounding board in terms of the science and the applied perspective of the work. The project was sponsored by energy companies involved with offshore wind, uh, of which you will see the logos of the main sponsors on the slide. Yes. So what we hope to get out of it, well, basically an easier life for everybody involved with the issue of wind farm construction, noise and harbour purposes. Us, the industry, uh, the regulators, the nature conservation bodies and wider stakeholders, nothing less. 
allowing us to move away from speculating about impact to letting the data, the evidence speak. The hope was that there would be less uncertainty in impact assessments and better informed decision making, which should be to the benefit of uh, everybody. Particularly, we had our eyes on supporting the development of an evidence-based tool that could be used by the competent authorities at a strategic level to assess and manage population level consequences of offshore wind farm development in the North Sea, cumulative impacts being the major concern. Uh, we have no illusion that the DEPONS model version 2.0 is the answer to all our or everyone's one else's prayers. There is a lot of opportunity to further strengthen and develop the model, and we very much hope that others will be interested to pick up on this. But we do believe it marks a major step forward in terms of understanding impacts of wind farm piling noise, and that it holds a lot of promise upon further development as a means of ensuring human pressures more widely can be managed in a sensible manner to ensure a long-term viable harbor porpoise population in the North Sea. And with that, I will end my presentation. Eloise? Thank you, Jesper. That was a great introduction to the programme. Um, and as Jesper mentioned, we um, won't um, wait any longer before handing over to Jakob Nelv Nielsen, who's been the scientific lead on the on the programme. Um, he's a senior researcher at Aarhus University. So, um, Jakob, I will hand over to you now. Thank you, Eloise. Let's see mm -hmm. if we can get this to work. All right. Thank you, Eloise. Um, so, uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, give a presentation at this webinar, which will be focused on the developments of the DEPONS model since version 1.1, which came out about a year ago, and also on how the users may actually use the model, and of course, something about how the model was developed also. And now I should be able to forward this. Uh, oh, Eloise, could you help me getting one slide back, please? Thank you. So a bit about the background. Hmm. There. So a bit about the background of the project and of uh, the model development. Uh, marine species, they're known to be influenced by various types of noise, including pile driving noise from offshore construction and um, seismic survey noise, ship noise, and all kinds of things. And there's long been a, a need for a framework to assess the combined impacts of different kinds of noise on marine populations. And it's not really been available. And during this project, we developed an individual-based model called DEPONS for assessing the effect of pile driving noise on harbor porpoises. But the model can be extended to other species and other areas and the North Sea wet was initially developed. Um, the reason why we used an individual based model, which is also sometimes called an agent based model, is that they often produce better predictions, they have a higher predictive power than the classical uh, population frameworks, and they are able to do spatially explicit investigations of local effects so you can look in a small part of the landscape at what's going on there and it all comes down to modeling the impact on population based on what happens to the individual animals that is what an individual based model is in order to make sure that we do that the best possible ways for investigating the impact of noise we have to identify how noise influences animals. And we very early on decided to model the movements of individual harbor porpoises as a starting point. Because animals move through the landscape, this is a, a track of real porpoise this far, uh, seen from above, it's a GPS track. So animals move through the landscape and when they encounter food in some areas, they usually go back to that area repeatedly, in course, which, which causes them to forage more efficiently. And you can see that from the track as a very convoluted part of the track. Then what happens when animals get exposed to noise, such as noise from pile driving, which is what I've shown here, 
is that they move away. They get deterred by the noise and they, by moving away, they forage less efficiently because they don't stay in the places where they found food before. And they don't have time to, to forage in the period where they're really scared. But at the same time, they lose energy. And in our model, it's a balance between energy intake and energy uh, use that cause them to sometimes have a higher risk of dying if they're low on energy. So that is the core of the model. So to put the model in a different way, if we start in the ellipse in the top, we simulate movements of individual animals. That is the core of the model. And as animals they move through the landscape, they use energy as a, at a fixed rate. Because, uh, and then now and then they find food. It's, it's located in patches, which causes the animals to increase energy, their energy levels. At the same time, the amount of food found in the patches is decreased by the same amount, which is important because that means that the amount of the food in that patch is no longer available for other uh, poor poisons in the population. So there is a density dependent um, density dependence uh, in the model built into it, which limits the population size. In the third ellipse, uh, we can see that we have there's a mating and there's a chance of giving birth and lactating, etc., at certain times of the year. So that depends on when the what season it is. So there's also a temporal aspect in the model. And in the end, there's an energy dependent mortality, which is influenced by all these other components. And the population size is something that emerges from a balance between the births and the mortality. So it's not something we force into the model. That's why it's sometimes called a bottom up model, where we simulate individual animals as realistically as possible. When we introduce noise into it, as I said before, that influences the movements and uh, also the energy uptake of the animals and ultimately may influence the mortality of either the calves or of the adults. So as you can see, it is really important in this model to simulate the energy as carefully and as realistically as possible and also the movements to make sure that the simulated animals, they forage just like animals do in nature in order to get the population dynamics to be just like in nature. That is the aim of the whole project and of the model. One component is to model the food distribution and modeling the distribution of porpoise prey items, uh, well, it's very difficult to to directly measure the amount of food available because we, we can't catch all the fish. They're, they're sub-commercial sizes most of, mostly, so there's not a lot of data on the fish, but because porpoises, they require a constant and high energy intake rate, we can use the presence of porpoises as a proxy of food availability. In the place where there's a lot of porpoises because they need to forage all the time, there must be food. And in order to get a grip on where the porpoises are, we use the national survey data on porpoises from around the North Sea. Let's see if we can forward this. Yeah. Um, and that was from all the countries around the North Sea that, that supplied data in a standardized format and a total of uh, 251 survey days in, distributed on different seasons and areas. And then we extrapolated these findings using generalized additive models to predict the porpoise densities outside the areas where the porpoises were surveyed using area surveys. Another core element of the DPONS model is movement. We need to make sure that the simulated animals, they move just like animals do in nature. And in order to do so, we had to equip a lot of animals with uh, telemetry tags. And I was really fortunate to collaborate with a, a lot of great scientists that can do this. It's not very common to do that. Um, and we were also quite fortunate that in Denmark, in the inner Danish waters, the commercial fishermen sometimes use pound nets where the animals get trapped. That allows us, as you can see in the topmost pictures, that allows us to 
go out and release the animals that have been captured in the pound nets and equip them with uh, either satellite transmitters or GPS transmitters to get the fine scale movements. In the North Sea, the fishermen, they don't use pound nets, so instead we had to catch animals actively, and that was a very tricky business. And again, I'm indebted to all the other people in, in the uh, department here for helping out. First, a bit of a look at the fine scale movements. That was based on GPS tracked porpoises. We had six animals that we successfully equipped with the GPS uh, trackers, three of them caught actively by Röme and three caught by Skane. And uh, we aggregated the data on a half hourly time step in order to analyze the data on a time step that matched the time scale that was used in the model, which was half hourly. And we analyzed how the movement tracks were related to environmental variables in order to make the tracks or the, the movements respond to environmental variation in the model, just like it does in nature. And we we found out, if we look at the real animals, we found out that the, uh, the tracks, the uh, speed and the turning angles of the real animals were related to salinity and bathymetry, but not to a whole range of other environmental variables. So we decided to include maps of salinity and water depth in the model in order to simulate movements. And then afterwards, we gradually calibrated a correlated random walk by releasing six animals in a virtual version of the landscape, releasing them in the same places as where they were attacked in the real world, and then got them to behave just the same way as the real animals did in the same parts of the North Sea. And that is the core of the fine scale movements in the model. I didn't show the turning angles, but that's the same thing. You can refer to the, uh, the trace document, the documentation of the model to see more. Uh, we also used data on a much coarser time scale based on satellite track porpoises that, that gave a position per day, one position per day or one every two days. And we used the data set, which was uh, 32 animals, in order to make sure that the home ranges were the same in the simulated animals as they were in the, the real animals. And to do so, we calibrated a spatial memory model that allowed animals in the model to return to places where they had found food before whenever they experienced a low energy level. So low energy caused them to go really far. And we calibrated this large scale movement behavior to get just the same home range sizes as we observed for these satellite tracked animals. So now we have a movement model that makes the simulated animals move just like real animals, both at the fine, fine time scale and at the rough time scale. And therefore, they, they are able to forage in realistic landscapes and extract the right amount of energy, just like real animals, and also be exposed to noise in the right parts of the landscape to make everything resemble a real, uh, uh, anim real animals. But we still have to simulate noise in order to be able to expose the uh, animals to noise in the right parts of the landscape. And here we focused on pile driving noise as uh, the pile driving noise emitted during construction of wind farms, offshore wind farms. This is a picture from the Gemini wind park. And you can imagine that a pile of this size, when it's hammered down, it produces a lot of, of noise. So first we modeled noise from individual pile drivings in the model by finding out what the source level was during construction of Gemini. We did that by, or some of our colleagues, put hydrophones out by the pilings during construction, which allowed us to calculate the source level during the pilings. Then afterwards, in the model, we modeled the noise level, which is the red line on the figure to the right, as a function of distance using a spherical spreading model. So now we can model noise in a relatively simple fashion, but we still need to model the impact that the noise has on the animals. And what we did was to 
we assume that the the tendency of the animals to move away from the noise was proportional to the noise level as long as the noise was above a certain threshold level so now we just had to find that threshold the green bar there indicates the uh, the amount of deterrence that the animals experience which decreases with distance from the source and deterrence is simply an attempt to get away from the noise so now we have to find this threshold level uh, unfortunately we couldn't just go out and measure animals because we couldn't tag animals in the vicinity of the wind park but we could measure the densities, at least the relative densities at different, densities, uh, different uh, distances from individual pilings during construction of a wind farm. In this case, it was a Gemini wind park we used. So while the individual pilings took place, we measured the presence of porpoise or the number of porpoises using sea pots, which are acoustic, passive acoustic devices that measure the clicks that porpoises emit for while they're foraging or navigating so just after the pilings there were less clicks and then gradually or relatively rapidly the porpoise came back to the areas close to the piling this had to be incorporated in the model and to do so we built a virtual copy of the gemini landscape an exact copy of this and instead of sea pots we had small areas where we measured the number of porpoises in the simulation and tried to twist up and down this threshold level until we got recovery rates local recovery rates that mimic the ones that we observed in nature and that is what we can see here if we focus on the figure up in the top left corner you can see the recovery after piling ends we have time after the pilings ends uh, on the x-axis and we have relative number of porpoises on the y-axis and it's at the distance 1.5 to 3 kilometers in this case from the nearest piling and you can see that the black line indicates that at this distance from the nearest piling the uh, population densities come back to what they were before the piling after approximately four to six hours and we tried all different kinds of threshold levels and picked the threshold that caused the, diff the red and the black lines to be as similar as possible by minimizing the, the squared deviation. And this is actually the, the best we could get out. And I think uh, considering that we deal with real animals in nature, we, we get a fairly close fit. Um, sometimes the real animals behave in ways we can't quite explain, but Considering that, we get a close fit. So now we have an, a model where we have both movements, distribution of food, and reaction to noise mimicking what we have seen in the North Sea. So we have a model that is ready to use for any users. Um, and the way a user can use this is simply by downloading this, this software, the Deepons 2.0, uh, which is freely available from GitHub. We'll supply a link. Uh, so anybody can install that on their own computer, PC or Mac or Linux, and run it if they have Java available. And they shouldn't touch the, the calibrated values for movement or animal life history traits or reaction to noise unless say, they, they want to see what happens. But they don't have to, because that has already been calibrated to mimic North Sea conditions. So all that the user has to do is to provide an ASCII file for sub areas in the North Sea uh, where they want to look in more detail at what happens locally for the population. And the user also has to provide, uh, provide an ASCII text file with the X and Y coordinates for the individual pilings, the sound source level, that is the impact, and the start and the end tick. The model runs in ticks, that's half hourly time steps. So in this, the first line indicates a, an impact of 225 decibel, sound exposure level, uh, and 50 ticks. So that's 25 hours of piling. And the way it looks when you open the model is this. Let's see, maybe if I do like this. 
yes, now it runs. So all the user has to do is open it and um, decide which wind farm construction scenario to use. In this case, it's a North Sea scenario one. Uh, and then just start the model. And then after a few seconds, you see that the porpoises, they show up in random parts of the landscape. Up in the right hand corner, you see the ticks. So that's half hourly time steps. You can also zoom in on individual porpoises and see how they, they move through the landscape. You can monitor the tracks and you can decide where they should see the tracks. And after a short while, porpoises aggregate into the parts of the landscape with food. They're dead in the other parts of the landscape or they have moved to the parts with, noise, uh, with food. You can also zoom into the, uh, the wind farms that you have specified and monitor how the individual pilings take place and how the porpoises, they are scared away from the individual pilings. They light up in red when they are, when they're being piled and turn black when they have been piled. And you can also see that some of the porpoises, they turn red after a short while. That means that they're low on energy. And low energy level means a higher risk of dying. It doesn't mean that they die straight away, but if they keep being low on energy, they have a really high risk of dying. So that's the core of, of the model and how to use it. Really, really simple. And, whoops. Oh, yeah, I think it got clicked. Yes, one back, please. <laughs> Elise, could you please help me getting one back? Uh, maybe. Ha, thank you. <laughs> All right. So the model generates the model generates two different kinds of output. Every half hour, it generates a line in the text file with the number of porpoises in each of the different blocks that the user specified, and in the whole landscape. It also generates a list with the X and Y coordinates for all the track porpoises. The user specifies how many porpoises they want to have tracked and where they should be tracked, and what part of the landscape the tracking should start. And this is an example of one of the, the tracks that come out of it in a simulation where I made a continuous pile driving. So this is a piling that just goes on forever. But with all the movement parameters and thres uh, the sound threshold level from the Gemini. So as you can see, if you continue piling in a certain area, the porpoises do get scared away, especially when they get very close to the sound source, which is by the X in the middle, whereas their reaction to noise is not as strong when they're further away from, from the sound source. And you also get um, the population size out on a half hourly time step. And this is an example of three scenarios that were used in uh, both in a published study and that are included with DPoints 2.0. Um, and this is to illustrate what you can do. Uh, in this case, we, we made some massive pilings to make sure that there was so much noise generated that animals got scared out to a distance of 200 kilometers from the nearest piling, which is not realistic. But this was to amplify the response to make sure that there was something to, to show the user. And the aim of this is to demonstrate that that construction schedule can be important for the porpoises. And this is something that you can investigate using an individual based model, but you cannot investigate that using any other modeling tool that are not spatially explicit. So this is a unique thing for the DPONS model, which uses this. In the figure to the left, we have a random piling schedule for 65 uh, wind farms that are piled in a random order. So they are the number of wind farms that, that match what would have to be built in order to meet the EU green energy development targets, uh, 2020 targets. So it's, it's, it's based on reality, but still in random locations. And as you can see, the population size dips in the part of the uh, graph here where, the, where there's a, a pink background. So the population is influenced while piling takes place, but then afterwards the population recovers to the carrying capacity that it had before the piling, uh, piling started. In the scenario in the middle, we have the same 
wind farms being built, but we start out building the ones in the eastern part of the North Sea and then turn to the ones in the left. And here the pilings have a much larger impact on the population. And the reason is that that the animals they're scared away from a certain region of the North Sea for such a long time that they entirely lose memory of how to go back to these great foraging grounds. They, they don't survive the ones that have this memory. And in the last figure, the one to the right, we again run the same piling scenarios. The only difference is that the break between the individual pilings is no longer two hours, but just one hour. And that also causes a larger impact on the population than the first piling scenario. And the reason is that the animals, they do get back and keep foraging uh, just after the piling takes place, but they're scared away again so fast that they can't fully exploit the food that is found within the wind farms. So the impact is larger. It seems from this that um, that noise doesn't really have an effect. But imagine that this is only one kind of noise and that the deep points model has the ability to include all kinds of different noise sources. And in principle, if you include a lot of different noise sources at the same time, you may also be able to investigate uh, what it takes to include so many noise sources that you get the population down to a critical minimum population size that need to be investigated further. So that's another opportunity to, to look at that using the DPONS model, include different noise sources. Uh, let's see. All right. So to sum up, uh, the DPONS model makes it possible to study population effects, including the exact location and timing of disturbances for the purpose. And the model can be used for spatial planning to produce, to reduce the impact of disturbances and for environmental impact assessments, because it's providing a transparent tool that is freely available for anybody to investigate and where each of the components have been published and are freely available. So, there's always possibilities to improve a model, but this is at least providing a totally transparent and open framework where it allows the users to explore the different components. Furthermore, the DPONS can be extended to assess the cumulative impacts of different types of disturbances and to work on other species uh, as long as movement data are available. And that was my last slide. I'd like to thank in the end uh, a lot of the people that have helped out funding this and uh, there's a list, list of references. But aside from that, I think it's uh, time for, for questions. Thank you, um, Jakob. That was really good to see that, especially the, the demonstration of, um, of the tool there. It's very helpful. Um, I, uh, it's now time to submit your questions. I've already seen that there are um, some really good questions coming in and the format will be as I will, um, I'll moderate those and um, ask those of the, of the panelists. And so if you continually um, submit them, I will try and get through as many as, you, as many as we can over the next 15, 20 minutes or so. So to kick us off, um, I just uh, got, a, got some good questions coming in from, from listeners. Um, firstly, in terms of the um, the input data, um, what would you, what did you have any comments about how representative um, the Gemini wind farm is, and if is there any um, any uh, um, opportunity to add more information about kind of wind farm construction going forward? Yes, well, that's an excellent question. <laughs> One of the reasons why we use Gemini is that that was a place where we had most data available. Uh, so, and, 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 uh, so we basically used what there was. Uh, we also initially wanted to make sure that we, 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 um, we parameterized the model based on data from a non-mitigated wind farm. And there are the opportunities to uh, calibrate for places where bubble curtains are used. It mm. is, it's fairly straightforward. And there are plans of getting other wind farm data from other wind farms uh, to test the model. Um, as to whether it's it's representative, uh, that's, well, 
response distances are up to about 11 kilometers in the Gemini Wind Park. And, and sometimes, uh, in some places, it has been reported that, that, that porpoise may, may respond out to slightly longer distances, maybe up to 20 kilometers. But there, then again, sometimes 11 kilometers is fine. Great. That um that partly covers um uh, another question that we've re received here about um the acceptance of uh, acoustic deterrent devices and other deterrent devices in the model. You mentioned bubble curtains there, but is there um would it be possible to integrate lots of different mitigation um devices and and solutions um into into the model as well as things like low noise piling as well? It would. Um... The easy part is is the pingers and, and seal scarers that you often use as deterrence devices before the onset of the piling, because they're already included in the Gemini. You, there's, there's simply no data for wind farms where where mitigation devices uh, have not been used. So so this is the combined impact of seal scarers and the pilings that were used for calibration. Uh, when it comes to the use of uh, other other types of pilings, uh, possibly <laughs> it's a tricky question though because we don't have much data to support it with at the moment as to whether whether the uh, the responses are the same uh, for other types of pilings. Cool. Okay. Um, another one um, on kind of expanding the, the the breadth of the model is: um, is there any work undergoing or any thoughts about whether this the Dupont's model could be expanded for other other species? So um, to other uh, uh, other marine mammals such as central place foragers or other non-marine mammals um, as well. Ah yes. <laughs> well, this 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 very framework. Um, is built for non-central place foragers. So it's simply not possible to teach a porpoise to move as a seal, unfortunately. But we're currently working on developing, uh, I'm, I'm collaborating with the people, people from SMRU uh, in Scotland to develop a similar framework for seals. And we are planning to, uh, to extend the deep hunts work to other species that are not central place foragers. So that is to use the deep hunts model itself just recalibrated for other species, uh, depending on, on, on funding available, of course. Okay, great. great. Um, and then uh, uh, what's something that you also have um, touched on a little bit, it's just about um, understanding how the, the food distribu distribution is affected by noise as well. So um, the way that fish may be affected by, um, and whether they relocate due to the noise as well, and whether that's integrated into the model. It's not, but that's very exciting, and it's something that 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 needs a bit of of, of model development in order to temporarily uh, either increase or decrease the amount of food in the areas with noise. You could imagine that that the fish get numb when exposed to noise, and therefore they're more catchable, or that they're simply gone. So you need to temporarily decrease the amount of food. It's not currently in the model simply because we haven't been able to acquire the data yet. But that's one of the things I hope to to move into in the future. It's 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 really exciting to look at those aspects of the cumulative impacts. Mm. Um, and um, uh, similarly, um, along that same thread, is, um, in your opinion, what would you say the key sensitivities that are of the, the Deepons model, deep model and, and building on that, where you think these desensitivities would um, would shape the um, shape the further research that that would need to be done on the on the on the Deepons model and to develop the model. Yep, um, we we looked at that in detail in the Deepons 1.1. That is the version of the model that was made a year ago, uh, but where the fine scale movements were taken from the inner Danish waters. But we guess that the sensitivity is the same in this version of the model and. The uh, sensitivity analysis we did back then indicated that it's the deterrence threshold. The sound level beyond which animals start responding to noise that is by far the most important parameter in the model. Um, but another thing that, that earlier work has indicated is that the actual kind of large-scale movement model that we incorporate may also be important, although that, that's not a parameter in the model, but the model output is sensitive to exactly the mechanisms underlying the movements. 
So that's two main things to look at. Mm. Um, one here on um, about uh, the uh, how and a question about how source level and t the decay of piling noise was modelled. Yes, it's using a really simplistic approach uh, in this case because this was was intended to demonstrate uh, how uh, or create the framework basically. So it's use it's assuming 20 log r that's spherical spreading. It's one of the uh, the noise models that is commonly used. Uh, it may be worth, and we we currently consider doing that. Uh, it may be worth using other uh, sound um, uh, attenuation models uh, that maybe take depth, uh, water depth, bathymetry into account, and other things. So we're currently considering that. Okay. And um and a question here about the kind of applicability of the model during um uh, the actual use of a, of a of a wind farm and whether the um the outcomes have been tested with disturbance disturbance during operations and maintenance work on a wind farm such as when access boats may be accessing um the the wind the wind the wind turbines um during the operation of the wind farm and whether there is a way that the deep pods could um could could cover that at all. That was <laughs> in the old version, in, in the in the model that was there before deep hunts, we actually had included boats. We haven't done it yet in deep hunts, uh, partly because there's not much data available to parameterize a model with. So one thing is that we can easily build a model where we have boats going back and forth and, and sending out noise, but we need to somehow be able to measure whether the porpoises are getting scared and at what distance they get scared. But I have a hope that that's something we will get data on in the uh, not too distant future. And then it's certainly worth including uh, those parts of the model again when we can mm. calibrate it correctly. Yeah, that's encouraging. Yep. Yeah. Um, there's a couple here um, of more technical questions, but practical ones, which would be good to cover off for those who are listening. Um, the question here is about um, um, whether the model includes R packages to show the outcomes, um, and if not, is, could you recommend what packages could or should be used? Oh yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's a good question because the amount of data that is generated by the model is immen immense, it's huge. Imagine monitoring populations every half hour time step, so you can generate gigabytes of data. And we have been using all kinds of different R packages, including the, 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 the core itself. But for the movement tracks, we have used AD Habitat and uh, for the same also for, for analyzing the uh, home range sizes, AD Habitat, uh, uh, RT and LT. So, so that's some key packages for that kind of analysis. Okay, great. Um, and similarly, on a more practical level, when you're using the model, um, are the model outputs uh, are is there is it just a visual tool or is it possible to get kind of hard copy outputs of the model while, when you are using it? It's both at the same time. So the 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 Deepons model comes with two different options. The one I showed you before was the GUI option where where there's a graphical user interface where you can click things and see tracks and 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 watch the the densities develop over time. But if you want to run the model slightly faster, uh, there's a batch mode that generates a lot of raw output very fast. But the output files produced are the same for the two different uh, versions of the model. So that's basically raw text files uh, with a lot of data on, on the number of pull points per click and their positions in another file. Okay, good. Um, and um, a more detailed question in terms of uh, the way that the model works is how did um, you and your team account for false negatives in the model? Um, in the, the the question here talks about um, recent research that um, that 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 lends us to believe that potentially harbour porpoise might stop clicking when they encounter loud noise, so they so that we might not able to hear them if they're in the area. Is that something that you you've considered or, or found in the in the work? Ah, that's true. It's not included explicitly in the model, but but there were some uh, investigations uh, during the construction of Alpha Ventus where there were aerial surveys conducted 
at the same place as where the the uh, the C pods were used that suggested that there was a very high correlation between the densities as observed using aerial surveys and um, and uh, C pods, and that that caused us to uh, to include that. It's something that is very very difficult to investigate, and which is we need to look further into in the future. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, that's that's good, and 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 I suppose more of a kind of pra practical question as well is, um, can the model be used if you don't quite know the exact location or timings of of construction of a wind farm? So almost speculative in terms of what could what could go ahead. Um, so maybe if you only roughly know the wind farm location and maybe not the type of turbines or foundation yet. Yes, and that 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 is actually the uh, the the. A major part of all simulation models, such as the climate models, for instance, you don't have to wait for the future to come before you try out scenarios of different kinds. So this is a great advantage that any user can build any wind farm in any place they like, uh, using the source levels that they want, and try out what construction schedule is harming the population the least uh, in a very, very controlled way and, and, and documented. Uh, mm -hmm. based on this tool. So very useful um, for, for planners as well, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and a question here about whether um, D the DPONS model could be update updated to utilize new prey field maps as they become available. Um, HP prey maps are currently in development. Um. Yes, uh, the, the, the easy part is that if you're happy with the prey maps only shifting every three months, as they currently do in the model, you can simply rescale re the output from those models and just put it in there as a background map, because it's a simple GIS map that is used to define prey. You just have to make sure that it sums up to the t same total as it influences the movements on the average. But as long as you, as you scale the, uh, the background map the same way as they're done in DPONS, it's a GIS exercise that takes a few hours only to do okay. so, to include other prey fields. Okay, that's good. Um, and then there's here a question here about foraging strategies as well. So um, in in your work and um, and your observations, um, is there any is there any evidence for porpoises having different foraging strategies? So, um, for example, do some porpoises have a smaller forage, foraging area that they know well and they are almost residents in that territory as they forage? Um, and are, do other animals have different behaviours where they might spread a little bit further and um, spread out their foraging area areas and um, lie more randomly encountering food um, and 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 if you have a comment maybe on whether which one fits better with the with the with the deep ponds model and whether there is a um, the, the model covers both these types of foraging activities in 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 a, in, the, in a in a strong way ah i love that question thank you <laughs> <laughs> It's a very tricky question, though. But but uh, the 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 short answer is that that what inspired us to develop the movement models that include in deep hunts was the complexity of the real tracks. Some animals seem to stay in the same areas for weeks or sometimes months, whereas others they roam the entire North Sea. And it seems that they come back to the areas where they've been before all the time. So we have included spatial memory at different scales. In the model, um, so in the model, the animals are able to come back to places where they found food before, if they don't forage successfully elsewhere. And we are able to generate the same home range patterns, same movement patterns in the model as we have observed in the real world, because animals are more they tend to come back to places with a lot of food more easily, and they they go back there and stay in small home ranges. Whereas animals that stay in, in areas that are slightly less productive, they tend to have larger home ranges and not come back to the places they've been before. So we try to do some tests of the fine scale movement behavior in the model. And we were so fortunate that it produces both types of behavior that we see in the, in the real animals, both the localized behavior and in the, the really large scale behavior, which is not something we initially put in there. So it's an emerging property of the movement model itself that it, it actually does both. Um, 
it's 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 um it's uh, it's a tricky thing though, <laughs> but it seems that there's something here that 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 uh, that this model already incorporates. That's good, and um, it's kind of related to this is that um, whether there is the 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 it's quite interesting at the moment to see that there's quite a large difference between random and ordered construction schedules. Um, do you have any idea of why that is? Um, and also, you know, you you mentioned animals not being able to not being able to kind of remember the high quality food areas is is there a time limit to this do you think well this is this is this is mimicking real animals quite closely and it, i could not have predicted that response before running the scenarios but after doing it they're easy to explain so so the the you may remember that that you if you make an ordered uh, piling schedule uh, constructing in the eastern part first and then in the western part the animals simply die when they're exposed to noise for a long time and get scared away from the area the animals that that cannot forage in that area have two opportunities either to move to another part of the landscape where they have to compete with animals that are already there or they they can temporarily go away and then come back but then they get scared away again so after the piling stops in the in either the eastern or the western part of the North Sea, there's simply no animals left that have a memory of how to get back to the foraging grounds there, and it's 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 a similar reasoning that's behind uh, the the order of the uh, of the piling, um, so that if there's a shorter break between the pilings, the uh, the animals they can't come back and explore uh, exploit it. So again, it's it. It makes a lot of sense afterwards also from looking at the tracks, but it's not something we could have predicted without the model itself. Interesting. Um, and in terms of as we learn more about um, the the effect, the distance of the effect on the porpoises, um, there is the, just checking that there is the, the ability to um, change that, um, change that distance um, in, in the future um, and as we learn more and whether we learn that the wind farms have either a far, further reaching effect or um, a smaller reaching effect going forward there is the opportunity to change those distances is that right yes that, that that's very easy because you can just in the input file that you provide provide as a user you can assume a larger uh, sound source level so so that that that's that's the same as um, that's the same as um, increasing the effect Mm -hmm. And then is there any um, thought about, um, I'm interested to hear your views on things about food distributions and also behaviours um, um, compared to daytime and nighttime and whether there is um, th that's been considered within the model? Uh, I'm sorry, could you please repeat that? Um, whether there's any difference in behaviours um, during daytime and, and nighttime in the, in the North Sea and the food distributions in, um, at different times of mm -hmm. the day? We have not included that. Uh, we know that 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 the prey that they actually prey on, uh, they have a, a, a diurnal behavior, but that's not included in the model at the moment. Okay. Okay. All right. Then we've had some really really good questions, and I'm and I'm and I'm trying to get through as many as possibly can. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I am aware that we are we are nearly running out of time. And Jakob, you've done, you're doing a very good job of continually answering all these questions. And I'll try and get <laughs> through. It. I'll try and get. Um, I'll try and get a few uh, through a few more before before we close out the close out the webinar, um, and I, I suppose a little bit more an understanding on how much the the noise landscape in the North Sea has been integrated into the model so far. So, um, shipping and seismics, um, and so that you look at the kind of additional the additional effects from power driving and additional noise effects on on harbour porpoise across the whole spectrum. Again, it's not something we've looked at this far. So this is this is made exclusively for, for pile driving. Um, but the model can handle some of these effects already now. The user can include some of them there, but the moving sound sources, well, in order to model them, you need to update the model slightly. It's, it's something we have in the pipeline for future work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I suppose then that uh, leads to a question about, you know, um, the the model as now we now have version 2.0 and um those who are listening and those who attended the first the first um first webinar are keen to know about um 
the use of this now in decision making and, and in their day to day lives and what else, what's coming down the line for for deep ones going forward um, in terms of um, in new um, new uh, new research or new new adjustments to the to the to the deep ones model going forward. Oh, we are currently discussing all kinds of things. Um, I believe that this is already, as it is now, a very solid um, uh, model for management. It's not that it's producing perfect results, but it's producing better results than you can possibly do with with non uh, non process based models because it's it's directly involving the different processes, and it makes it transparent to discuss what components that might be wrong or might be right and then let the user explore what happens if you relax certain assumptions so it's i hope that answers the question it that it is useful mm -hmm. and we can keep improving it infinitely basically mm -hmm. because it's it's a structure that that allows us to refine the components that the population is sensitive to yeah and there's uh, there's been lots of really interesting questions here as well, which kind of food for thought for you and your team as well, Jakob, going forward. Um, one uh, one final one, which I would I'd like to ask, is a kind of um, the way that the um, the the model reviews the harbour porpoise population in the North Sea, um, and whether it currently assumes that the, the harbour porpoise is at its carrying capacity um, and whether they're, where this, where, whether that's true and where these numbers came from? It's, uh, it's relative. Uh, yes, it, it assumes that, that, that the porpoise population is current, currently at a carrying capacity that includes all the noise that they're currently exposed to. That is the shipping noise and and the extraction of, of, uh, of fish that have occurred over the last many years. Um, you could put it the other way around. If, if a population was not at a carrying capacity, then why haven't we, we seen an increase in uh, the number of port poisons during the scan surveys that have occurred over the last many years? It seems to be more or less the same numbers. So that requires some kind of density dependence going into the population in nature and therefore that's a good argument why we should build on the same mechanisms in the model mm -hmm. uh, again i hope they answered the question <laughs> yeah, no no that makes that that makes that makes sense yeah um and just um from your understanding a question here about um uh operation noise from turbines um i'm from my understanding um there's recent research that says that this is negligible but i'm wondering if there was anything from your side that you can comment on that, just to close that out as, as an issue. Uh, it's 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 highly variable. Uh, mm. It's 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 we often observe the same number of porpoise close to existing turbines. Yeah, I think the, the 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 best answer is to say that it requires further research. <laughs> it's yeah. clearly not as strong as as the impact of pile driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. And then there's one here about um, the um, the deterrence threshold um is currently one five two decibels. Um. Is it possible to to adjust this in the model? Um. In such as you know as through um different countries they have different um thresholds. So in the Netherlands being one four one one four zero decibels or maybe one four five. Um. It'd be good to see the the, the differing effect according to the decibels that have been inputted into the model. Uh, yes and no, uh, because you can't adjust the threshold. That's that's the th same threshold across the whole landscape. But increasing the threshold by one decibel is equal to, uh, let me see if I get it right, uh, to lowering <laughs> the the uh, the uh, sound source level. So a, a change in one decibel in sound source level by one decibel is the same as changing the threshold by one decibel. So you may just change the scenarios instead of the threshold it's the same thing okay yeah that makes sense yeah well excellent so i feel um i'm, I'm sorry if um we haven't got through to your questions we've had so many really really good ones and um i hope that um i hope that you've covered we've covered off at least one of the questions that you've that you've put forward um you can see there on the screen that there are email addresses and 
Jakob and Jesper are really happy to take your take your questions via email. Um, if you have specific questions about the way that the research was carried out, um, and there is also there's also um, lots of information on on ResearchGate from all the work and and the Airhouse website and all the, all the work that's been gone into the Deepons the Deepons model. Um, I just want to have one last question to kind of close that out, and this is one from me actually, <laughs> Jakob, about mm -hmm. um, if you had now your unlimited budget and you were going to design the next next uh, piece of research, what would it be? Um, um, what was what's the what's your burning desire when it comes to the next stage for for, for Deepon's version 2.0? My burning desire for Deepon's <laughs> version 3 4.0 or something <laughs> is to make a holistic framework that can be used for for analyzing impacts of all kinds of disturbances and extraction of uh, prey and other things maybe even climate changes on a range of different species where we can get different uh, different uh, data different data available mm -hmm. so that that is a long term goal to um, to get this yeah, well, that sounds like a really valuable piece of work. So I um, hope that will long term goal comes true. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Well, thank you all um, for, for joining us today. I hope you found that useful. And like I said, the, the recordings and the slides will be available um, on the DPONS website going forward. Um, and do get in touch if you have any questions. But um, it just leaves me to say on behalf of the DPONS team, thank you all for, for joining us and have a really good rest of the day. Thanks. Thank you.